Are you having any difficulty studying for the biostatistics abstracts of the USMLE Step 1, Step 2 CK or Step 3? Then you must watch this tutorial. In this video, I will be going over examples of questions from an abstract, show you how to solve these questions, where to look in the abstract so you can find the questions quickly because the time is extremely limited on the USMLE exams. This lesson is taken from my biostatistics course. So if you want to see more examples of the abstracts, a detailed explanation of this biostatistical concepts tested on the USMLE exams and the ones discussed in this video, make sure to check out my biostatistics course and I'll leave the link for that in the cards above and in the description below. To make this video more practical and more interactive, I'll be switching now to slides so I can show you actual examples of abstracts and questions and how to solve them. So let's get started. Let's start with the first abstract that is taken from this article here and the article is published in the JAMA Network Open. So before we go into the questions that relate to this abstract, we have multiple questions for this lesson. Before we go into the questions and how to solve them, I want to give you a general overview of the structure of the abstracts or how you might be asked about this before we go into the questions themselves. So the first thing that you need to know is what is an abstract? So an abstract is like a summary of a research article. A research article starts with an introduction, generally followed by methods, results, discussion, and at the end there is the conclusion of the study. And if you want to know more about the uh, research and how to write papers, how to design a study, you can check out my research course. But for the purpose of this uh, lesson, I'll be focusing only on the abstracts for the USMLE exams. So as I said, there is an introduction, methods, result, discussion, and conclusion. However, research articles are long, 3,000 words or more. So that's why readers sometimes just want to know the summary of the study. They don't want to go and read the full article, and that is the purpose of the abstract. The abstracts give the reader a summary or a quick overview of the findings of the study, how they did the study, and the conclusion. So the background of the abstract that is this one here reflects the introduction of the study. The methods is how we did the study, what did the authors do to conduct the study, the study design, the population. The results of the abstract reflect the finding of the study. What did the authors find after conducting the study? And the conclusion reflects the conclusion of the study. The discussion of the paper is not included in the abstract. So we only have background, methods, results, conclusion. Because we are limited in space, most journals restrict the number of words to 250 words. So that's why you don't have much space to talk about everything. Sometimes they present you only the abstract text in the exam. Sometimes they present you the abstract text in addition to a table. So you see here, this is the table. There are columns, there are rows, and we will go into the details of these once we solve a question. But generally, just I'm showing you the structure of the abstract when you're asked in the exam. Generally, there is a text or a table or both or a figure. So here you can see that sometimes they give you figure and the abstract. Sometimes figures and a table, only figure, only table. So there are, there are different variations. That's why you should be able to extract the information from the from any of these so you'll be able to solve the question if you are present with only one of them. Now let's go ahead and start with the first question. So the key to solving abstracts efficiently is to extract the information that is needed to answer the question. Because if we go back and look here at the abstract, probably this abstract will take you around two minutes, two minutes and a half to be able to read the full abstract and understand it well but you don't have that time in the exam. You don't have to read the full abstract to be able to answer the question. And this is what I'll be teaching you throughout this lesson. So the first trick to solve the abstract efficiently is to start with the question. So don't read the full abstract and then go to the question. Start with the question or the answers and then go to find the answer to that question. And by answers, I mean here, read the answers. But if the question is short like here, I would start with the question itself. So based on the study results, we can conclude that. And then you start reading the answers and you would go back to the paper or uh, the abstract or the table to be able to identify the correct answer to this question. So based on the study results, we can conclude that patients with resolving AKI have a significantly higher risk of make compared to patients with no AKI. So now I have not read the abstract text. I haven't looked at the table. I'm just reading the question and the answers or the choices. So in this case, I'm able now to understand that there is two groups in this situation. Patients with resolving AKI and patients with no AKI and the outcome is make. So that's why you should be able with time after you go through this lesson, after you solve multiple abstracts, you start 
extracting information about the study groups, which two groups are we comparing? Because most studies or most research, you compare two groups or three groups. So you should start thinking, what are the study groups? There is for each study, there is an outcome. What is the outcome of this study? What are we trying to predict? Are we trying to see if there is difference in survival between those who smoke and those who do not smoke? Are we trying to see if there is difference in lung cancer? So there is always an outcome and study groups. And I explained the details of that in the first few lessons of this course. So make sure to check that out before you go to the abstract lesson. But generally for each study design, for each study, there is comparison groups and there is an outcome. So here I can see that probably one of the two groups or two of the groups in this study is those with resolving AKI and those with no AKI and make because they're saying higher risk of make, that means make is one of the outcome. So this is what I get from reading A. And this is not the speed that you should be going through in the real exam. Now I'm explaining each choice so you can be able to understand that. But in the real exam, you'll just be reading and extracting information and going on. So the second one, although both resolving, non-resolving AKI make that no AKI. So now I can see that there is resolving AKI, non-resolving AKI and make as an outcome and no AKI. So maybe now there are three study groups instead of two. And then the risk in developing MEG between resolving is similar. So patients with non-resolving AKI have significantly higher risk of MEG compared to resolving AKI. We can't compare no AKI because the reference, uh, no AKI is the reference value. So after reading these choices, you should have an idea about the study design. Again, you don't have to understand every single choice. You shouldn't spend too much time reading the choices. You shouldn't spend so much time trying to decipher what they mean. You're reading these very quickly. Maybe you don't need to read the, all the options. Maybe read one or two and try to go and start to extract information from the abstract and the table. This is the key to solving the abstract questions efficiently. So now we know that the choices go around the idea of risk of make among groups. So now I want to go to the table to see what's going on in this study. So you read the abstract text. You can read the abstract text and I'll do that at the end. But I want to show you what is the most efficient way to get the answer to this specific question. And for this specific question, it's the tables. Always try to find the answer in the tables. Why? Because they are more organized. The text can be confusing. The numbers might be mixed with words and there is no structure for the ways to find information in the abstract other than that this is introduction, this is methods, this is results. But inside the results, everything is mixed. But in a table, there is a structure. There is comparison groups in columns. There is outcomes or risk factors in rows or the opposite way around. So there is a structure to the abstract, to the tables. So that's why I prefer to get the information from a table. And honestly, even when I'm doing research or reading a research article for my own benefit, I look at the tables before I read anything because the tables can help me put things into perspective. So let's read the title of the table. Association of AKI recovery with make. So now I know that they are trying to assess the risk of make based on AKI recovery patterns or try to assess the association between these two. And here you have A. You don't have to read every single detail of every symbol here, A, B, C, stars, but you can just have a quick look here. You can say composite of say, uh, chronic kidney disease incidence, progression, dialysis, or death. So this make stands for all these. And here you can see abbreviation. Make stands for major adverse kidney events. So they're trying to predict make based on the AKI recovery patterns. Let's look at the rows of the study or the table. So the first row is no AKI, no AKI. And AKI stands for acute kidney injury. They're telling you, no, this is no AKI. This is resolving AKI. And this is non-resolving AKI. And here you can see non-resolving compared with resolving. So now based on this, I can tell that there are three study groups in this study. No AKI, resolving and non-resolving. And this one is just trying to compare these two. Sometimes, or the majority of the times, you, feel, you see the study groups in the columns. But here they have the study groups in the rows and they have the outcome in the column. Here they give you the number at risk and here the number of events with percentage. So the number of patients with no AKI is 769. Here you have 475. And the number of patients with non-resolving AKI is 294. How many patients of these developed make? This is the number here, 192. So 192 out of 769 or 25%, you can see here uh, between parentheses is the percentage, although they don't have it here, but they tell you that in here. So 25% of patients who had no AKI 
developed make compared to 42 here and 54 here. So you can see how the percentage is increasing. The numbers sometimes don't tell you the whole story because maybe this group is larger in the first place. So the main thing is the percentages and also definitely the hazards ratio. So in the previous lessons, I talked about the relative risk, the odds ratio. What makes hazards ratio different is the, the fact that hazards ratio include time in, in this calculation. So relative risk is yes, no. You develop the outcome, you didn't develop the outcome. But hazards ratio include the time factor when getting this number. So that's why it's kind of time to event analysis. And as we talked in the previous lessons that the null value for the relative risk and the odds ratio is one. So if you get hazards ratio of one, that means the two groups are similar. If you get a hazards ratio of less than one, that means there is less risk in this group. If you get hazards ratio of over one, there is higher risk in that group. The 95% confidence interval, again, we discussed that in detail in the previous lessons, but in summary, the 95% confidence interval give you an idea about the population, not only the sample that you are studying. And if your 95% confidence interval crosses the null value for what you are studying and the null value for the hazards ratio, we said it's one, that means there is no statistical significance. And this is, should be also reflected by the p-value. If the p-value is below 0 0.05, that means it's statistically significant. If it's 0 0.05 or above, it's not statistically significant. So these two numbers uh, can give you an idea about the significance of the association. So when you're doing these tables, again, you don't have time to go through the details of these things. You should be looking at certain specific things from the table. And I'm going to tell you now at the end, if I was going fast, what I would be looking at, but now I'm explaining everything. So you have an idea uh, about the details of the tables and how they're structured. So again, if you want a detailed discussion of the confidence interval, the p-value, you check out that specific lesson. There is a full lesson about the confidence interval and the p-value. But let's start looking at this row here. This one says one or reference. So when you have multiple groups, one of them should be the reference and the other two would be, uh, you, would, you would have a hazard ratio in reference to that group. So if your reference is the no AKI and the resolving AKI is 2.05 and here you have 2.9, that's in reference to the no AKI. So there is higher risk of developing make in the resolving AKI compared to no AKI. And the hazard ratio is 2.05. As I said, the null value is one. If you have hazard ratio of over one and here you have two, that means there is higher risk. But as we said in the confidence interval lesson, the hazards ratio, relative risk, odds ratio by themselves don't give you enough information. Because yes, you might have a hazard ratio of maybe 10, but this difference or this association is not statistically significant. And to assess significance, you look at the p-value, and here you can see that it's below 0.05. So this risk is significantly higher in this group compared to the no AKI. And since the 95% confidence interval, you can see the range here does not contain the null value. That means it's statistically significant. And the same applies here. You have 95% confidence interval does not, that does not contain one, and the p-value is statistically significant. But these two numbers, the first one and the second one, gives you the risk in the resolving AKI compared to no AKI and the non-resolving AKI compared to the no AKI. So they don't give you resolving versus non-resolving. That's why they added this. And here you have the hazard ratio of 1.42, which means because the number is more than one, that means there is higher risk in the non-resolving AKI than the one that you start with compared to the second one. And this difference is also statistically significant and the confidence interval does not contain one. So now we can see that the p-value is significant for all the three associations. And now I can go back to the options to see which, ones is, are, which one is correct and which one is not. So this one is saying patients with resolving AKI have a significantly higher risk of make compared to patients with no AKI. So resolving versus no AKI. And the answer is correct because this is significant and the hazard ratio is over one. So this option is correct. B. Although both resolving and non-resolving AKI have a higher risk of make than no AKI, and that is true. So these two have higher risk than AKI. It's saying the risk in developing make between resolving and non-resolving AKI is similar. So it's saying these two groups have higher risk, risk than AKI, but when we compare them, they are similar. And that's not true. Why? Because this p-value is statistically significant. There is difference between these two groups. So B is, is wrong. 
Let's go to C. Patients with non-resolving AKI have a significantly higher risk of MAKE compared to patients with resolving AKI. And this is correct. Why? Because here, this p-value is significant. Non-resolving having much significantly higher risk compared to resolving. So A and C are correct so far. We can't compare no AKI patients to the other groups as no AKI, this group, is the reference value. So even if a, a group is the reference value, that doesn't mean you cannot compare it because this number here is in reference to the no AKI. So yes, you can compare no AKI to resolving AKI. You're, can, you're saying here resolving AKI is higher risk of developing the outcome per, compared to no AKI. So no AKI has significantly less risk. So having a group as the reference value doesn't mean you cannot compare it to the other groups. It's the opposite. It's the way to, to get the results is to compare the groups to the reference value. So from this question, we can see that A and C are the correct answers. And on the exam, generally you get one single answer as the correct one. But what they can do is they can say A and C are correct, B and D are correct, A and B and C. So always read all the options specifically for these confusing statements because sometimes you might think, oh yeah, this is the correct answer. And then you continue reading and you find a better answer or an answer that makes more sense or the correct answer and you understood the first one in a, in a different way. So especially for these type of questions, I recommend you read all the options and make sure that the rest are wrong when you're choosing the correct answer, especially if you have extra time. I know that sometimes you might be in a rush, you don't have enough time and you might go with the first correct answer you have, but if you have an extra time, you can read the options and make sure that the rest are wrong. Again, specifically for the statistics one that talk about comparison between groups. So if I wanted to solve this question correctly, I would have looked at the groups and identified that these are the study groups, that this is hazard ratio. I look at the p-values directly and see that these, I see that these are over one and I can tell that resolving AKI, non-resolving AKI, and these two groups have significantly higher risk. And then I go and uh, choose the correct answer. So you don't have to look 2.05 and the confidence interval. If you have already the p-value, you might ignore the confidence interval. If you don't have p-value, you might be able, you need to look at the confidence interval to identify significance. And it's much easier to look at one number compared to looking at the range and see if one is in between. So if, if you wanna look quickly, you look at the p-values, see if this is over one, less than one, and go and answer the question. Now let's go to the next question. For assessing the risk of making patients with non-resolving uh, non AKI compared with resolving AKI, the authors decided to report hazards ratio of 1.44 instead of 1.42. What is the reason for that? To answer this question, I want to see what, what do they mean by 1.44, 1.42? Where did they get these numbers from? So here they are saying resolving, non-resolving. So I know that now this is this group here. And I can see here 1.42, 1.44. And then I go and look up quickly. Unadjusted hazard ratio, model one. And you look at B, you can see adjusted for variables. And this should ring a bell in your, in your head because this is an adjusted hazard ratio and this is adjusted hazard ratio. So if, when you do statistical analysis, there is univariate analysis. So you study each factor separately from the other factors. And the second way is the multivariable analysis in which you study the association between groups after you adjust for, another, for other variables. And I talk in details on how you can perform the multivariable analysis in my statistics course. But for the purpose of this course and this lesson, I wanna give you how you can answer the question. So multivariable analysis try to adjust for the confounders. So maybe the, this non-resolving group have patients who are older, who have a worse situation. And the reason why we have worse outcomes in, in this group is not because of the resolving AKI itself. It's because of the age or BMI or the race or diabetes or different factors. But after you adjust for these factors and you still have the same effect, that means it's these two groups because we adjusted for potential confounders. And I talk about confounders in the bias lesson. So if you want a better discussion of the bias, you can go to that specific lesson. But in summary, the multivariable analysis try to adjust for confounders. And they're telling you here, why did the authors choose this hazard ratio compared to this hazard ratio? And the reason is because this one adjusts for confounders, adjusts for variables that might affect the results. So the answer would be, adjust for confounders here, C. And you can see the other options allows for long-term assessment, no. Adjust for effect modification, no, that doesn't relate to that. Increases bias and it's actually the opposite. Once you adjust for confounders, you decrease bias. And power here is not related to this, uh, to this question. 
So we do multivariable analysis and sometimes they write it here, multivariable analysis. Sometimes they have more complicated uh, terminology for this multivariable analysis, but that would be usually reflected by the word model or multivariable, or they say adjusted for these variables that should ring that bell. And the answer would be to adjust for confounders, which helps decrease bias. Some might ask, can we choose model two? So here they provided you with two models because when you build the multivariable analysis, you can choose different variables to adjust for. You can include different variables in the model. So here they gave you two models, model one and model two, and they explained B and C. And they said here, these are the variables that were included in model B or the first model, sorry, model one. And these are the variables included in model two. And they say here, additionally adjusted for kidney disease, which means they included the variables included in model one in addition for to this uh, variable. So model two has more variables than model one. And you might ask, which one is better? I can't tell from this. We need to look at multiple other factors to choose the model. So you, the purpose for the purpose of this lesson and this abstract and USMLE exams, they won't ask you to compare different multivariable models. But you just need to understand that there are multiple models sometimes and they might differ in the numbers, they might not. Here you can see that the conclusion is the same. 1.44, 1.51, they're very similar. The p-value is the same, it's significant. So choosing model one, model two for the purpose of this question and this lesson is not gonna make a difference for you. But an adjusted, which means univariate analysis versus a model, there is a difference. And you can see how I'm trying to answer these questions based on the table, because for the purpose of this specific abstract and this specific question, they are the easiest to find. And sometimes you might not find the answer to this question in the abstract text. So I'll show you at the end the text and the abstract and which question we could have gotten from the abstract or both. But for this specific question where they're giving you hazard ratio, numbers, comparison, probably the abstract table is the best, not the abstract text. Now let's go to the third question. Let's read the question before we look at anything. The authors performed Kaplan-Meier analysis to assess the survival probability among the three groups. Based on the figure, to the left, we can conclude that. They might not ask you based on the figure. They might just ask you, based on the study findings, we can conclude that. Whenever you see Kaplan-Meier analysis, go directly and look at the Kaplan-Meier curve directly, because that is the easiest way to find the answer. And you can see here how, with time, there is decrease in survival probability. So this Y curve starts with one. So if you're decreasing probability, that means people are dying. There are less patients left at the end of the study alive. And these curves here represent each study group. So we, you remember we had no AKI, resolving AKI, non-resolving AKI, and these lines are separate from each other. And this is the p-value. So there is so much information in each figure and you have to be quick in looking at the things that matter to you. So here you can look quickly look, you can see the three study groups, you can see the p-value, that these numbers are decreasing with time, and here you can see the number of patients at risk and developing the events at each of these time points, so at time point zero, two, four, six, and eight years, and here are the study groups. So this number reflects the number of patients in the no AKI group that uh, were at risk of developing the outcome. So all the AKI patients, because we are in the beginning of the study. And here are the number of events. So how many patients developed the outcome? And then you can see the number of no AKI patients at two years. And this number is decreasing for multiple reasons. Some patients might leave the study. Some patients might develop the outcome. Some patients might die. So there are multiple reasons why this number goes down. The number at risk, I'm not talking about the number of events, the number of risk, because for multiple reasons, either attrition or uh, developing the outcome. So that is the number of patients in each group here, and the between parentheses is the number of patients developing the outcome. So if I had a glance at the figure, I can see that there is significant difference between the groups because the p-value is significant. So now I can go and read the options. There is no significant difference in the survival or in survival between the three study groups. And that is wrong. Why? Because the p-value is significant. There is significant difference in survival between resolving and non-resolving AKI. So they're telling you there is significant difference between the two. And let's, let's keep this to, to the end. There is a significant difference between in survival between at least two of the three groups. That also might sound correct because there is significant difference. So this one is telling you between two groups. This one is telling you between at least two of the three groups. And D is there is a significant difference in survival between each of the two groups. So option D is telling you there is 
significant difference between these two groups, between these two groups, and between these two groups. So which option is the correct one? When you see three groups and they give you a p-value for the Kaplan-Meier analysis, what does this p-value represent? And this actually is the very similar to the ANOVA test. ANOVA, you're comparing mean between three groups. Let's say you're comparing mean age between smokers, uh, current smokers, uh, previous smokers, and non-smokers. So you have three groups, current, previous, and none. When you get a significant p-value for the ANOVA test, you can't tell where the significance is coming from. It might be current versus the non-smokers. It might be current versus previous smokers, maybe previous versus none. So the p-value is just telling you that there is a significant difference between two of these groups. Maybe all of them, maybe only two of them, we can't tell. We need to do a post hoc analysis to be able to identify where is the difference coming from. But based on this p-value and the same apply here for the kaplan meier analysis, we can tell that there is a significant difference between at least two of these three groups. So option C is the correct one. Option B is wrong because we can't tell for sure based on this p-value. It might be correct, but based on this information, we can't tell if there is a significant difference between resolving and non-resolving. The significant p-value might be from resolving versus no AKI or non-resolving versus no AKI. And probably this difference is, is significant because these are the two furthest uh, curves from each other. So when you see a p-value and three groups, you can tell that there is a difference between at least two of the three groups. But you can tell for sure, again, based on this information presented here, which two groups are the significant ones. And option D is also wrong because it's not between each of the two groups. Because if it's between each of the two groups, that means all the comparisons are significant. That might be correct, but might not be correct. Based on this information, we can't tell that for sure. But based on this information, we can tell that there is a difference between at least two of the three groups. And the reason we have this interpretation relates to the null hypothesis of this test. So the null hypothesis of this test says that there is no significant difference in survival between any of the three groups. So when you get a significant p-value, you reject the null hypothesis and you can say that there is a difference between at least two of the three groups. Or you can say that the null hypothesis is incorrect. The null hypothesis saying that there is no difference at all is incorrect, which means two of these three groups, at least two of these three groups have a significant difference. Now let's go to the fourth question. The fourth question is asking which of the following study designs is conducted in this scenario. And based on the tables themselves, we won't be able to answer this question. So we need to look at the abstract text. And you don't need to read the full text of the abstract to be able to answer this question. This question is asking about study designs. And you should be able to identify where can I find this information in the abstract. Study designs, study population, inclusion exclusion criteria, the outcomes, the main outcomes that are being studied, are usually in the methods. So you don't need to read the background, results, conclusion. You go directly to the methods to be efficient. And this, the first few lines of the methods are saying this prospective multi-center study. So now I know it's a prospective study. It's three groups because we were solving questions related to three groups. The main thing that I need to know now, is it randomized or not? Because as we talked in the first lesson about study designs, when you have prospective, it could be either prospective cohort study or it could be a randomized controlled trial. So here we read the first few lines, we don't see randomization, which means this is a cohort study. So if they had prospective cohort as an option and retrospective cohort as an option, the, the answer would be prospective cohort. But if they don't mention the word uh, prospective or retrospective at all, the answer would be just cohort. And if they said they randomized patients to different groups, the answer would be C, because it would be a randomized controlled trial. Case series, as we talked in the first lesson, it's only one group. Case control, you start with the uh, outcome and you go back to the exposure. An ecologic study is totally different than this in, because the unit that you are studying is the population, not the individual. So the answer to this question is cohort. And you see how I was able to answer the question by just reading the first few lines of the methods. Now let's go to question five. Why did the authors match the study groups based on, based on demographic characteristics, comorbidities, and pre-hospitalization estimated GFR. So they're telling here me that they matched the groups and I was not aware that they matched the groups. So if you look here, uh, a participant with or without AKI were matched. So you don't again need to read the abstract to answer this question because you should be familiar with the idea of matching and what it does based on your biostatistical knowledge. So although sometimes they mention things that are in the abstract or 
they might be there. The answer of why they matched is not in the abstract. It should be from your knowledge. So a question like this, although you might, oh, this I didn't know that they were matching and now I need to make sure that they are matching. No, you don't need to make sure that they match. You just need to answer the question. So why would you match two groups to reduce lead time bias? No. To ensure that external validity would not be threatened? No. The idea of matching doesn't relate too much to external validity. To decrease effect size? No. To reduce baseline differences in groups? And that is the correct answer. Because when you match groups on based on age, on GFR, you make them similar. And we talked about matching in the bias lesson. So if you want to uh, have a discussion about that, you can go back to this lesson. But when you match two groups, you make them similar. So you won't have differences based on age, BMI, if you match for these groups. So you eliminate these factors from affecting your outcome. So that's why the baseline differences in the groups become more similar if you match them based on these characteristics. So you won't have patients with very high B, uh, GFR and patients with very low GFR in different groups. You would have similar GFR between the groups. To increase effect size is also wrong, so the answer would be D. Now let's go to question six. Which of the following describes the null hypothesis of this study? And as we discussed in the hypothesis lesson, the hy null hypothesis is against what the authors are trying to find. So where can you find the goal of the study or the main uh, hypothesis of the study? It's usually at the end of the background or the end of the introduction in the full text article. So here you can find it at the end of the background. The alternative hypothesis in this study is that there is a relationship between kidney function recovery and the long-term outcomes. This is the alternative hypothesis. Although they did not state that clearly, sometimes they need to be more clear. Like we hypothesize that the uh, early recovery of kidney function is associated. So what the authors believe. But from this we can get a hint that this is probably the alternative hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is the opposite of that. So if the authors believe that recovery of kidney function is associated with make, with the long-term outcomes, what the null hypothesis would be, it would be the opposite of that. That the recovery of kidney function is not associated with long-term outcomes. So answer A is probably the correct one. Why? Because they're saying the opposite of what the authors are trying to find or what the authors think the results of the study would be what the authors hypothesize. If the authors hypothesize that the early recovery of kidney function is associated with long-term outcomes, this would be their alternative hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis would be the opposite of that, which is the recovery of kidney function is not associated with the long-term outcomes. Let's look at BCD. Uh, early recovery of kidney function is strongly associated with long-term outcomes. And that is not uh, alternative hypothesis, neither uh, the null hypothesis. You don't usually include strongly uh, in the hypothesis itself. You can say just associated. Let's look at option C. Early recovery of kidney function after acute kidney injury is causal of specific long-term clinical outcomes. So this is a more specific uh, hypothesis. And if you look at the main hypothesis or the study aim, they didn't talk about specific long-term outcome. They talked about long-term uh, risk of clinical outcomes in general, the make, which includes multiple things. So that's why this option is not correct. And this option is not even the alternative hypothesis. So the alternative hypothesis in this case is more generic. And this is very specific. And that's why this is not even the alternative hypothesis. Early recovery of kidney function after acute kidney injury is generally associated with long-term clinical outcomes. And again, you usually don't include generally, uh, slightly, strongly. You just say associated or not associated. And this is definitely based on the hypothesis of the main study, which is the alternative hypothesis. Now I wanted to read the abstracts quickly, just to make you more familiar with the concept and the structure of the abstract. Again, in the exam, you don't have to read it, but now I just want to read it quickly, explain some, some concepts and some questions that you might be asked about. So the background, the severity of acute kidney injury is usually determined based on the maximum serum creatinine concentration. However, the trajectory of kidney function could be an additional important dimension. So they're giving you a background about the research question. And then at the end, usually they have their research hypothesis or the study aim. We sought to assess whether the trajectory of kidney function recovery within 72 hours is associated with long-term risk of clinical outcomes. So they're trying to see the association between the two. This prospective multi-center study enrolled 1,538 adults with or without AKI three months after hospital discharge and they give you the dates of enrollment. So this is multi-center, which means they conducted that across multiple centers and it's prospective studies, prospective study. Participants with or without AKI 
were matched. This is the idea of matching we talked about based on demographic characteristics, uh, the site, comorbidities, and pre-hospitalization uh, GFR. Participants with AKR were classified as having resolving or non-resolving AKI. So now they explain how uh, they define resolving or non-resolving AKI. So if they ask you a question, patients with resolving AKI were defined as you find this information in the methods. Why? Because this is part of the study design or the inclusion criteria or definition of their uh, inclusion criteria. So patients were classified as having resolving AKI based on previously published definitions. So in the real, in the full text article, they would put a link for these previously published definitions. And the abstract, there is no much space to include that. But in the, in the full text article, they would give you the link for these definitions. But actually here they explain these definitions because probably this is an important factor to be included in the abstract. Resolving AKI was defined as decrease in serum creatinine concentration of 0.3 mg per deciliter or more or 25% from the maximum in the first 72 hours after AKI diagnosis. So you see that these information are not helpful for you to answer the question unless you're asked about it. So that's why you don't need to read it how they defined the resolving, how they didn't define non-resolving unless they asked you about this. But now you know if they ask you something related to the inclusion criteria, definition of some variables or outcomes, it's probably in the methods section. Non-resolving AKI was de defined as AKI not meeting the definition for resolving AKI. Makes sense. The primary outcome was a composite of major adverse kidney events or make defined as incident of or progressive chronic kidney disease, long-term dialysis, or all-cause death during the study follow-up. So here you can find the definition of the outcome. Make is the main outcome. You can see here the primary outcome was. So if they ask you what is the primary outcome of this study, you also find the, this answer in the methods. And the primary outcome is make. Because sometimes the survival is a very important outcome if people died or not. But this might not be the primary outcome of the study. So the primary outcome of the study is not something you can guess. It's what the authors decided based on their clinical knowledge, based on the literature. So if they ask you what the primary outcome, you have to look at the abstract and see what is the primary outcome. And generally it's the main, every table resolves around the primary outcome, but you need to confirm that specifically from the abstract. Now we can see the results. The results of the table might be also included in the text or it might be different results. So sometimes if you can't find the information in the table, you can go to the abstract text to be able to find this information. And you can see here, it's, it's harder to find the information from the text with all these parentheses, all these numbers compared to table where you have a structure. You know that these numbers belong here. These numbers belong to this group. It's much easier to find info and numbers from the tables. Among almost 1500 participants, you can see that this is the number of males, this is mean age. Here you can see the percentages in each group. So 50% had no AKI, 31% had resolving AKI, and 19% had non-resolving AKI. They give you the median follow-up and they tell you the results are summarized in the table. But sometimes they give you the results in the text itself. And you can see the conclusion. This study suggests that the 72 hour period immediately after AKI distinguishes the risk of clinically important kidney function long-term outcomes. So if you have resolving versus non-resolving, it can make a difference on the prediction of make, which is what we already discussed when we found this uh, significant p-value. The identification of different AKI recovery patterns may improve patient risk stratification, facilitate prognostic enrichment in clinical trials, and enable recognition of patients who may benefit from nephrology consultation. So this is, they give you the implication of this study. What can, make, what can we make from this information? We already discussed the table. Here you have the groups. Here you have the outcome, univariate analysis, multivariable analysis in two models. Here you have the p-values, and here you, here you have the abbreviation usually under each table with some symbols that explain some of the analysis done or some of the models discussed in the table. And we already discussed the figure as well, how the Y column here in this specific example represents survival. And sometimes they might have uh, one here and it goes up and you have the curve in the opposite way. But here they started from survival of one, which is 100% and they went down as the time went on. And here you have the number of risk, number of events. They might ask you a question about here. They might ask, what is the number of patients with no AKI at risk of developing make at four years? And the answer would be this one. Or what is the total number of patients in the no AKI group 
that develop the event at six years and this would be the number so make sure that you are familiar with every uh, portion of these tables figures uh, in your preparation i mean you don't need to look at these details if you're not asked about it in the exam but make sure that you are familiar with this commonly tested biostatistical concepts so when you are asked about it you just answer very quickly and you won't spend too much time trying to decipher decipher these figures and these tables so you saw now how we answered these six questions without needing to read the full abstract we read the full abstract and we found that it didn't help us answer more questions you might be asked about specific things and you can go and look at the abstract for that specific portion without needing to read the full abstract because you won't have time during the real exam and that brings us to the end of the first abstract now let's go and discuss the second abstract imagine they gave you the abstract text presented here with a figure and a table and again you don't have time to go through all these but i can look at this figure in a few seconds and i would be able to understand the basics of the study without having to read everything you might choose to go and read the first question directly or glance at something that would help you understand the basics without spending too much time so i'm gonna explain what i look at when i see this figure so here i can see decreased risk of adh increased risk of adh so i know that adh is an outcome so it has to be quick and you'll get more experience as you solve more abstracts as you read more research papers but you see increased risk decreased risk adh that means adh is an outcome now i look at the other columns number with adh on the number exposed to a drug so now i know that drug is the risk factor because they said exposed and if you look here anti-epileptic drug exposure in pregnancy so now i know the risk factors are probably different drugs used for uh, epilepsy and these are exposure during pregnancy and they're trying to see whether patients or the children develop adh or not and there is hazard ratio as the way to assess that so how much time did that take if you just look at adh no adh you glance here exposure in pregnancy hazard ratio and again you see adh exposure to a drug that probably take 10 seconds so now you know what the researchers are trying to do you can also look here at the end of the background the objective of this study was to determine whether prenatal uh, exposure to falproate and other aeds is associated with increased risk of adh in the offspring so that could be another way for or you to assess the objective of the study or just to have an idea before you read in but some again some students start directly with the questions and try to look the information for that for me personally i prefer if there is some efficient way looking at the main columns looking at a quick figure that would take 10 seconds or less i do it otherwise i just read the questions and the answers so let's start with the first question they say a 37 year old woman comes to the office for a routine preconception checkup her history is notable for tension headaches hypertension meningioma her current medications include acetaminophen labetalol and fibroid which of the following should she be told based on the results of the study so here i need to see the results of the study because in order to take a conclusion and tell it to a patient i need probably to see the conclusion of the study so i can read here maternal use of falproate but not other aeds during pregnancy was associated with increased risk of adh in the offspring these findings have important implications for the counseling of women of childbearing potential uh, childbearing potential using falproate so now i know that falproate is associated with increased risk of adh but not other aeds so the patient has uh, is taking falproate and she's coming for a preconception checkup so that's why the study applies to this patient because she's taking a medication that was found to be associated with increased adh but not other AD, aeds so what can you tell this patient let's read the options she should cease taking anti-epileptics during pregnancy that could be correct answer if she continues to take falproid after becoming pregnant her child will almost certainly have adh maybe we need to see the risk of developing uh adh after taking falproid is it 100 percent or it's not 100 percent switching to another aeds will not help prevent adh in her child since she has already been taking it but the study did not take talk anything about that we need to confirm with the study results but based on the conclusion here it didn't say that if the patient was using before conception and then they stopped it and the patient became pregnant and stopped falproid that would affect the child this information is not clear so far she should consider switching to another AEDs before becoming pregnant. This answer seems reasonable. If she decreases her dosage of falproate, her risk of having a child with ADH will decrease. Based on the conclusion, I can't tell that. 
So I need to read the results of the study. So here you have two options. If you are encountered with this situation, you have two options. Either to answer the choice that you think is the best based on the information that you read from the conclusion, or you go and read the results to find more supportive evidence why the other options are not correct. And the answer here should be based on how much time you have. If you have five, 10 more minutes and you have time to read the, uh, the abstract and you solve all the other questions in the block, you can read the, app, the results section. But if you don't have much time, you should pick based on this quickly uh, reviewed information, which one is the correct one. So based on this, it's, the conclusion is saying that fibroid is associated with increased risk, but not other AEDs which can tell you if she switches to other AEDs, that would be fine. Because fibroid is the problem, not all AEDs are the problem. So probably answer D is the correct one. She should consider switching to another AED before becoming pregnant. So if I was in a hurry and I wanted to answer the question, that probably would be my choice. Because I can tell that increased risk in fibroid, but not the other, so she can switch. So to confirm whether the dosage effect or... Uh, before or after becoming pregnant or the certainty of getting ADHD, you have to read the results. You have to confirm that with the results. Let's go quickly over the results section and this figure, which can help us get more information. Or if they ask you another question that you can get the answer for from the figure or from the results section. So here you can see the different medications or different drugs. Here you can see the number with ADH on the number exposed. So the number of patients who develop the outcome, and the outcome here is ADH, can, uh, on the number of patients exposed. So how many patients were exposed to fibroid or how many patients were taking fibroid? It's 431. How many patients developed ADHD? It's 38. So 431 is the number of female patients or pregnant patients who took fibroid, and 38 is the number of patients who had children that developed ADHD. And here you have the adjusted hazards ratio. So adjusted means they already did a multivariable analysis. It's not univariate analysis. So that's why adjusted, they adjusted for some variable. And you can see here the hazards ratio for each medication and the 95% confidence interval. So here they didn't give you the p-value. So the p-value would be easier to look at because it's only one number. They gave you the 95% confidence interval. So for you to assess significant difference in the risk of developing ADHD based on the medication you take, you have to see whether the 95% confidence interval crosses the null value of the hazard ratio. And what is the null value of the hazard ratio? It's one. So you can see here whether one is in the range. And for the first one, here 1.05 to 2.19, one is not in the range. But all the rest, this 0 0.8 to 1.8, 0 0.9 to 2.1, 0 0.7 to 1.6, all of these have one in the range. So these, the other ones are not statistically significant. This one, the first one, is statistically significant. That's why the conclusion is saying fibroid is associated with increased risk of ADHD, but not other AEDs. Why? Because this 95% confidence interval, for the rest, it includes one. But for this one, it doesn't include one. That's why this one is statistically significant. And again, here you have the number of patients who developed ADHD in each of these groups. So 31 patients who were taking carbamazepine got children with ADHD. Here, 41 patients uh, who were taking lamotrigine got children with ADHD. And this is the total number of patients who were taking lamotrigine. This is the total number of patients here that were taking uh, carbamazepine. This figure is actually very helpful because it can tell you the information very quickly. So instead of looking at the p-value, 95% confidence interval, you can just look at the figure. So this one is the adjusted hazard ratio. So this number, the X, is the adjusted hazard ratio. So this one here. So 1.52 is this adjusted hazard ratio. So if you wanted to have this 1.52 on the x-axis, let's say it's around here, and you draw a line, it would be the middle of this box. So the middle of the box would be the 1.52 representing, representing the adjusted hazard ratio. And this two tails represent the 95% confidence interval. So these two numbers, the 1.05 and 2.19 are these here at the end. And you can see that they picked one as the line. So you can see that the line is drawn where one is. Why? Because one is the null value for the hazard ratio. Because if these lines cross one or this line here, that means this difference is not statistically significant. 
So by quickly looking at the figure, you can see if the line crosses the vertical line, if these 95% confidence interval, this one, this one, if they cross the vertical line, that means this difference is not statistically significant. Or these medic this medication is not significantly associated with increased or decreased risk of ADHD. But you can see the falbroid is the only one that doesn't cross this line. You can see this one crosses it here, this one crosses it here, this one here, this one here. So you can see all of them across the one at some point, except falbroate, both ends of the 95% confidence interval are over one. If both ends are below one, that, that means there is significant decrease in risk. But here you can see decrease in risk, but it's not significant because the 95% uh, the confidence interval, this line crosses the vertical line. If both of these, the, the box and the line, were around here, there, we can say that there is significant decrease in risk uh, of ADHD in the Lamotte regime group. However, that is not the case because this one crosses the vertical line. So this is the information we got from the figure. However, it doesn't tell us the dosage. It doesn't tell us when the patient should stop these medications. And this information might not be in the abstract at all. But to confirm that it's not there, you need to read. That's why this will take way more time. So if you think I'm 70, 80% certain that this is the answer and you don't have much time, just give your best guess and go to the next question. So here you can see the cohort included this number of children. Here you can see the mean age at the end of the study. You have median age, which is this one here. And you have the interquartile range. A total of 580 were identified as having been exposed to fibroid during pregnancy. So this is the number of patients who were taking fibroid. Of them, 49 had ADHD. Among this number of children who were unexposed to fibroid, this number had ADHD. So here we have 8.4% of patients who were exposed to fibroid developing ADHD. And we have 3.2% of patients who were not exposed to fibroid developing ADHD. Children with prenatal fibroid exposure had 48% increased risk of developing ADHD. And this is the adjusted hazard ratio compared with children with no fibroid exposure. Some might ask, why do we have different numbers here? Here we have 1.48 and here we have 1.52. In the real exam, you don't have time to wonder about these things. You have to be quick and answer the question. But here we, I can explain because here they're talking about monotherapy. So this is patients who are taking fibroid alone without any other medications. But for the purpose of the results section, they're talking about patients who are using fibroid, even if they had another medication. So that's why there is a small difference in the numbers. Now we can see the absolute 15-year risk of the ADHD was 4.6% in children unexposed and 11% in children who were exposed. No association were found between other AEDs and ADHDs. So as you can see here, the idea of dosage was not mentioned in the abstract, so we can't comment on that. That's why this answer is not correct. Also, the idea of timing, we couldn't find it. So switching to another will not help her because she already has taken. That is not included in the abstract. So we can't confirm that. That's why it's not the correct answer. But this answer is, is a, this choice is an interesting choice because she's telling you if she continues to take fibroid. So let's say the patient wanted to continue taking fibroid during pregnancy. The option here is saying her child will almost certainly have ADHD. And that is not correct because you can see here the risk of having ADHD after using fibroid was 8.4%. It's not 100%. So not every single patient who takes uh, fibroid will develop, their children will develop ADHD. It's only 8.4%. And this is the absolute 15-year risk. So this risk is adjusted for time. That's why it's, it's different. But in this case, D is the correct answer because she should consider switching to another AEDs before becoming pregnant. Because although it's not 100%, there is still higher risk of developing ADHD in the children if the mother uh, took fibroid during pregnancy. So the best option would be to let her change to another AEDs because the other AEDs were not associated with increased risk of having ADHD. Now let's go to the next question. What percent of study participants were between 7.2% and 2.8 and this information is definitely not in the figure so this is probably in the results so if you look here usually the age and uh, the bmi or the number of patients male female is in the first few lines of the results section so if you look here mean age at end of study was 10.1 years that is not what we're looking for median age was 9.4 years so this is close and here you can see the interquartile range were these two numbers 7.2 and 12.8 and these are the two numbers. So here, 
These two numbers are reflecting the interquartile range. So you just need to understand if we are including the interquartile range, how much percentage of our participants lie within the interquartile range. And the interquartile range is explained in detail in my statistics course, but just to give you a quick overview, the median represents the 50th percentile of your study. So 50% of your study participants are over the median and 50% are below the median. The earlier quarter range is the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. So between 25 and 75% of the study population, it's 50%. So that's why the answer is C. Because these two numbers are reflecting the interquartile range and the interquartile range represent 50% of your study participants. So you can see here, sometimes they ask you about median mean, sometimes they ask you about the interpretation of the odds ratio, relative risk, about study design bias. So you might be asked any question when you get an abstract. That doesn't mean it has to be specifically about the results of the study or about the study design. They might literally ask you anything about the study. But that's why you should look at the question and then you can go directly to the answer. And by the way, I'm presenting multiple questions per abstract, but in the exam, the maximum is three questions per abstract. So they're not going to ask you 10 questions about the abstract, only two or three. So that's why you don't need to invest too much time reading every single detail about the abstract if you can find the answer quickly. And we found the answer here by just looking at the first two lines of the results section. Now let's look at the third question. Which of the following is a limitation of this study? And I would highly recommend reading the options here because these type of questions, it relates directly to the options. So even if you read the full methods and you don't know the options, it's gonna be hard for you to know the answer. So we can start with the sample is too large for proper analysis. And that option actually doesn't make sense because usually whenever you have larger sample size, that's actually better for the analysis. So probably option A is not right, even if you have no idea about the study. Option B is missing cases of ADHD if children were never prescribed medication for ADHD or formally diagnosed due to less severe presentation. So they're telling you that this could be a limitation of the study and that option might be correct. The follow-up time is relatively short, so we need to look at the follow-up time. But if you remember when we talked about the result, they had this absolute 15-year risk. So 15-year risk is pretty long, so that probably follow-up time is not the answer. Women born closer to 1997 have higher likelihood of having used valproate than women born closer to 2015. So we have to look at the inclusion-exclusion criteria to be able to identify whether this answer is correct or not. The information from the national database is not reliable as data collection is inconsistent across hospitals. That could be an answer. Sometimes the databases are not accurate uh, because there is different ways of collecting the data from different hospitals. But don't assume that unless they tell you or they give you a hint for that uh, specific uh, option. So let's look at the methods because usually the methods would tell you about the limitations of the study. Because if they have good study design, everything was perfect, you would have less limitations. So to be able to identify the limitations, you need to find how the study was designed, what are the inclusion exclusion criteria, and be able to find a gap in that. So we can read very quickly the methods section. This was study of all Liburn singleton children in Denmark from this time to this time. Information of, on prenatal exposure to AEDs, including these medications, were collected from this database, the Danish National Prescription Registry, and all children with ADHDs were identified and here they tell you how they identified ADHD diagnosis. Children with diagnosed ADHD in the Danish Psychiatry Central Research Register or children who redeemed a prescription for ADHD medication. So they gave you how they identified the ADHD diagnosis. And in my research course, I explain in detail the, the importance of definitions. Because ADHD, how did you define that? Myocardial infarction, how did you define that? Did you define it based on enzymes, based on... Uh, ECG, how many millimeters, everything matters. So here they're giving you the definition they used. If the child was diagnosed and included in this registry or redeemed a prescription for ADHD medication. So if the child received the diagnosis or received treatment for ADHD. The court was, follow up, uh, was followed up for from birth until the day of the ADHD diagnosis, death, immigration, or this date, whichever came first. And Data were analyzed in September of 2018. The main exposure of interest was maternal use of falbroate and other AEDs in pregnancy. So this was the main exposure of interest, the anti-epileptic medications. 
So now let's go back to the options and see which one is the correct one. So based on this, you can have now an idea about the study design. That's why I recommend you start look, re reading the options. So when you're reading the methods, you start saying, oh, I found this. I didn't find that. This is, uh, this is probably the answer. This is probably not the answer. So we said sample is too large. It's probably wrong because they have so many large number of patients, which is good for the analysis. Missing cases of ADHD if children were never prescribed medication for ADHD or formally diagnosed due to less severe presentation. And this seems like the answer. And the reason for that is they're saying that one of the limitations of the study or one thing that could be a limitation of the study is that if a patient did not receive a formal diagnosis of ADHD or did not receive medications of ADHD, they might have been missed from the study. They're not included in the study. And I'm not sure what definitions they use to include these patients in the registry in the first place. This might be very strict criteria or uh, not everyone is included in the registry because they didn't receive diagnosis. So maybe less severe cases were not included because they didn't receive diagnosis. So in this case, you might be missing some cases that are less severe or they didn't receive medication. So that's why this could be a limitation of the study, missing some children with ADHD. Follow-up time is relatively short. That's not correct answer. Here they didn't mention something specific to patients uh, born closer to this time having used more fibroid. So we can't tell if this is an, uh, the correct answer. And since there is no information about that, you can't uh, choose it as the correct answer. And this is not reliable. They didn't mention something about not being reliable. If they said each hospital had their own way of diagnosis or each hospital has their own uh, entry system and these systems are different, that might be the answer then. But in this case, they didn't comment on it. That means we can take it as reliable. So in the, for this question, the limitation of the study could be potentially missing some cases of ADHD if the child was not diagnosed based on these criteria to be entered in the registry or if they did not receive treatment for ADHD. Now let's go to the fourth question. How many patients need to take falproate while pregnant to yield one additional case of ADHD? So what are they asking you about here? It's very important whenever they ask you these, like how many patients, the risk of this, the odds of that, you need to identify what they're asking about. Because if you're able to identify what they're asking about, you'd remember the formula for that and you would be able to identify the numbers. So these questions are have, have multiple layers. First, are you able to understand what this what these words stand for. After that, are you able to memorize the formula for calculating that? Then are you able to find the numbers that fit these definitions for the formula and then calculating that and getting the right number? So you see how there are multiple layers and there might be a mistake. You might commit a mistake at any point in these layers. So let's start. How many patients need to take a medication to develop the uh, additional case of ADHD? They're asking here about the number needed to harm. To calculate the number needed to harm, you need the attributable risk. And how do you calculate the attributable risk? By subtracting the difference of developing the risk between those who take, who have the risk factor, and in this case it's fibroid, and those who don't have the risk factor. And the first question, are you able to calculate the number needed to harm based on this figure here? And the answer is no. First, because they give you the monotherapy. So some patients might be taking fibroid with other medications, and that's why the information based on this figure will not be super accurate. You might be able to get falbroate versus the others, but you need the number for all the others. So you need to combine the numerators, denominators, and get for no falbroate, and then you would uh, subtract it from the falbroate. So this is going to be way more complicated to calculate it from this. The, probably the easier way is to find falbroate, no falbroate from the results section. So here you can see 580 were exposed to falbroid and 49 developed the ADHD. So this is the percentage. And here you can see this is the number who were unexposed and this is the number who developed the outcome and this is the percentage. So the attributable risk is very simple. You just subtract these two numbers. So 8.4% minus 3.2%. What is the answer to that? It would be 5.2%. So the number needed to harm is 1 divided by 5.2%. So 5.2%, remember always, 5.2% is 5.2 over 100. So 1 over 5.2% equals 100 divided by 5.2. And the answer would be 19. 
So C is the answer here. So the first thing that you need to calculate to get this number needed to harm is to identify the attributable risk. If they didn't give you these two percentages, you need to calculate it because it's very hard to subtract these two numbers, 49 over 580 and these two very big numbers. So it's easier to calculate the percentage and then subtract the percentage and then put one over the attributable risk and you would get the number needed to harm. Now let's go to the fifth question. Which of the following studies follows a similar design at this study? So we need to identify the study design of this study first so we can compare it to another study design. And to find the study design, it's in the methods section. So this is the methods section. This was a study of all live-born single-tone children in this uh, country from this time period. Information and exposure, and they talk about the exposure were found from the registry. And then they talk about the ADHD diagnosis. Court was followed up from birth until the day of ADHD diagnosis or death or immigration, whichever came first. Data was analyzed. Main exposure was maternal use of valproate and other AEDs. So now we have an idea about the study design. They started with patients who have exposure to valproate and other AEDs. They followed up these patients in time or the children in time from the moment they were born until they developed ADHD diagnosis, they died, immigrated, or until that day. So we started with the mother exposure to valproate and other AEDs and we followed up these patients in time until, or the children in time until they had ADHD diagnosis, they died, they integrated, or it was 2015. And this here is not a prospective study because first they didn't mention that and second because it's a registry. So if they are information already in the database, that means it's already happened. It already happened. We're not collecting it prospectively. So if they didn't mention prospectively specifically or say something that we followed up patients in the future, and there is something that indicates that it's starting now and it's happening in the future, you would consider this as a, as a retrospective cohort. Because we start from the exposure and we follow up a patient in time until they develop the outcome, but everything happened already. We're not following up patient in the future. Like now we're in 2021 and everything, the exposure started maybe in 2000 and we follow, followed up patients in chart un, until 2019. So everything already happened but we start with the exposure and follow up patients in the charts until they develop the outcome or die or immigrate. And to understand that better, you can go back to the study design lesson in which I explained the details of retrospective cohort, case control, prospective cohort, that would give you a better understanding of this. But if you start with exposure, follow up patients uh, in time in the past, everything in the past until they develop the outcome, that's a, pros a retrospective cohort. So now we know the study design of this study. It's a retrospective cohort. So now we need to read these examples and identify a study design that is similar to this. So let's start with the option A. Patients with sideroblastic anemia having higher exposure to lead. So we're starting with patients with this disease and we're looking at their prior exposure. So that's a case control. That's not a retrospective cohort. The association between schizophrenia and child depression is explored by following children with and without depression for several years. So we have children with depression, children without depression, and we're following of these patients for several years. So this is more likely a prospective cohort because they didn't say we looked in the charts, they saying we're following patient up for several years. So this is probably a prospective study. They might need to be more specific, but from this I would be tending more towards prospective study design. Investigators explore the relationship between a tap water pollutant and future incident of birth defect. So you have an exposure and you're looking at future incidents of birth defects. So this is also probably a prospective study design. The association between a novel antibiotic and sideroblastic anemia is explored through chart review, first differentiating patients based on their usage of antibiotic. So this is a chart review study. So we know that it already happened, it's in the past. We're identifying patients based on their usage of antibiotics. So we're starting with the exposure and we're seeing if they developed anemia. So that's a retrospective cohort. So D is likely the answer. So let's look at E. In a population of women pregnant for a second time, the survey shows that 7% of patients have a history of placenta previa. So this is a survey study. You go and ask pregnant patients uh, if they had the second pregnancy, placenta previa, and you look at the association and number. This is a cross-sectional study design. So from these options, D is the more likely to be similar to our study design here in this study. 
Now let's go to the final question from this abstract. Why is the crude hazard ratio different from the adjusted hazard ratio of ADHD in women taking falproin? And honestly, you can answer this question without looking at any of the tables or the figures. But I'm going to read the options, explain the answer, and then we can look at these where you can find this adjusted and crude hazard ratio. So the crude hazard ratio is more accurate. And actually, that is not correct. The adjusted is more accurate. The crude hazard ratio reflects the increased risk in the exposure group. And that is also not correct. The adjusted hazard ratio increases the risk of bias. And that's actually not, not correct. It's the opposite. The adjusted hazard ratio decreases the risk of bias. And we'll explain in a few seconds why. The difference reflects the effect of potential confounders. So let's look at the hazard ratio. Where can you find this crude and adjusted? So throughout the study, we didn't use this table. We were able to find the answers without using this table. But now we can look at this table because here we can see only adjusted. But the crude and adjusted are in this table here. Hazards ratio of ADHD in the offspring of women who use anti-epileptic drugs in monotherapy. This is why we said monotherapy during pregnancy compared with the offspring of men who did not use anti-epileptic uh, anti drugs in pregnancy. So here you can see all these different medications. Here you can see the number of live birth, the number of ADHD diagnosis, the number of person years at risk, and the incidence per thousand person years. I'm not going to go into the details of the incidence over person years because this is a big discussion and needs to be discussed separately. But briefly, it adjusts the incidence for the length of the follow-up of each patient because sometimes patients are follow up, followed up for different times and the longer the patient is followed up, the more likely they might have diagnosis that's why this incidence over person year it adjusts for the length of the follow-up for each patient so this is what we're interested in here the crude and the adjusted and this here number this number reflects the same idea that we were talking about here so you can see 152 and here you can see 152 so this is the hazards ratio of developing adhd in each of these groups so what is the difference between crude and adjusted and you can see here a a adjusted for maternal age at conception, maternal psychiatry history, so adjust for multiple factors. So this is the same concept that we discussed in the first abstract, the idea of univariate analysis and multivariable analysis. Univariate analysis, you're only studying the effect of falbroate on the incidence of ADHD. But what if patients taking falbroate are already different from those who are not taking falbroate? So it's not technically the falbroate that is affecting the results, it's other factors like here, maternal age, or maternal psychiatric, psychiatric history. Maybe psychiatric history is what is causing the increased risk of ADHD. So these are confounders of your results, of your the relationship between the exposure and the outcomes. And again, I explained the confounding idea in the bias lesson. So if you want more detailed discussion about confounding, go, go back to that lesson. But in a few words, there might be factors, or we call them confounders, that might affect or blur the relationship between the exposure, and here it's falbroate, and the outcome is ADHD. So adjusted, it adjusts for these factors. So as a clinician, as a researcher, you should be able to identify which factors could be confounding your results. Sometimes we adjust for statistical variables. So based on uh, numbers, we identify which factors should we adjust for. So that's why the adjusted number is more accurate. It actually reflects the isolated hopefully the isolated effect of the exposure and falbroid here is the exposure on the outcome so we try to adjust for these factors and have only the relationship between falbroid and adhd so we try to exclude the effect of the age psychiatric history and the, and the others so that's why the adjusted is more accurate the problem with adjusted is that you won't be able to adjust for every single factor in your study there might be also factors that you have not collected or you're not aware of that's why randomized study design is the best because it by default adjusts the differences between the two groups that you are comparing because you're randomly assigning them to the treatment versus uh, the, another treatment or exposure versus no exposure but in this case we can't randomize patients to taking fibroid or not so that's why we need to rely on this study design but in summary the adjusted adjusts for certain factors that might affect your the relationship between falbroid and ADHD in this example. That's why it's more accurate. That's why in the beginning we had higher hazards ratio and after we adjusted, we, we had decreased in the hazard ratio. So the effect of falbroid on ADHD decreased a little bit, but it's still significant because the 95% confidence interval does not cross one. So although it decreased, it's still significant. Sometimes you might find after adjusting, 
the significance disappeared because these factors might be affecting the result. These factors are the reason for the result. When we adjusted for them, the difference disappeared. But not necessarily the numbers go down all the time. Sometimes they might stay the same, very small difference, sometimes might go up. So it doesn't necessarily go down. So the answer for this question, why the crude is uh, higher or different from the adjusted is because the difference, this difference between the crude and adjusted reflects the effect of potential confounders. These are the factors that we adjusted for. These are potential confounders of this study. And if you're familiar with the idea of crude and adjusted, you don't need even to look at the table to get the answer. So looking at the numbers did not help us to get the answer. It is because we know about it. Actually, if you look at the A and look adjusted for, and you might think, oh, these might be factors that are affecting the results, it might help you. But if you're familiar with the concept, you might be able to answer this without looking at the table. One final thing I want to discuss here is this non-exposed is the reference value. So those who are not exposed are the reference for these comparisons. So when we say hazard ratio of 2.37, it's in reference to those who are not exposed. When we say this 1.78 in the carbamazepine, it's in reference to those who are not exposed. And that brings us to the end of the discussion for the second abstract. That brings us to the end of this video. As I mentioned in the beginning, if you want to see more examples of the abstracts, detailed explanation of the concept discussed here and that are tested on the USMLA exams, make sure to check out my biostatistics course, which will cover these concepts in detail in an interactive way with so many questions and exercises. If you have any questions about abstracts or about the course, make sure to leave them in the comments below or feel free to reach out to me on Instagram or Twitter at Malka Asad, my Facebook page Malka Asad MD or our website through our email info at thematchguy.com. And by the way, if you're interested in learning about research, so you conducting research studies, doing the statistical analysis, we also have that for you. We have a detailed research course on how to conduct research studies, how to do the statistical analysis, and you can also find the link for that in the cards above and in the description below. If you find any value in this video, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell sign so you get notified whenever I post future videos on my YouTube channel. Thank you everyone so much for watching, and see you in future videos.